Welcome to the uh, the first Monday morning art history, Renaissance to Romanticism. Our topic is going to be, we can call it early Italian Renaissance or date wise, we'll roughly try to cover about two centuries. And let's start by talking about uh, Italy. Uh, maybe the best thing to, to mention is what Italy was not at the time of the uh, Renaissance. It was not a nation. It was this kind of uh, patchwork quilt of different uh, states and uh, kingdoms. Um, just like today, the Northern region tended to be the more prosperous and maybe the more politically stable. But you know, without uh, spending too much time with the map, I think you can see that there were papal states and the papacy was moving around during this era. It wasn't necessarily in Rome until um, 15th, 16th century. And you can also see that uh, the city states that we're really going to focus on artistically, Florence and uh, Siena are in the middle of the Italian boot. So the Republic of Siena, the Republic of Florence. And uh, of course, this was an era where there was a great deal of uh, you know, warfare and tension between these city states. Milan, which you see up at the north, was the constant enemy of Florence for, for many years. But that's how you want to think of Italy, not yet a nation. In fact, I don't think Italy was unified as a nation until uh, 1871. So before we look at the art, a little bit of context, a little bit of a history lesson. What are some of the developments in this period we're talking about? Well, a major one would be that the primarily religious view of the world began to change as we transition into the Renaissance. And a great deal of that had to do with the work of the humanist scholars. And in a later lecture, I wanna spend a little more time with humanism, but let me give you a very, very brief way of thinking about humanism for, for today's lecture. It was, first of all, it was the studies of the classical world by Italian scholars. That's one way to think of it. And then as a kind of a, a trend before it became a philosophy, it was a more human-centered view of the world uh, rather than a religious-centered view. So in this uh, changing era, the very prosperous Italian city-states, uh, most often led by oligarchs, had very, very specialized economies and specialized guilds. And we'll talk about what those were for a couple of the city-states. And if you would like a kind of a, a long, slow trend that will take you through this lecture and into the next lecture about Italy, you want to think of art as gradually moving away from medieval styles towards naturalism, towards a, a style that is more like the real world that's more recognizable. A few other things to mention, some important you know, social and, and religious organizations. This was a, a deeply religious period and begging friars, mendicants, uh, men who had renounced the material world uh, were very, very active throughout Italy, uh, spreading uh, God's word and God's work. The Dominicans and the Franciscans emerged as tremendously important. And we'll see an image of St. Francis in just a moment to, to flesh that out a little bit. And then also co-fraternities, which were groups that brought together lay people with religious orders, uh, grew tremendously in popularity toward the end of this period. So we mentioned St. Francis. Let's start with our first image of the uh, lecture and, and see how he was portrayed. This is a very, very early altarpiece that's in Pescia, Italy. Uh, it's from the early 13th century. And if you were to talk to an art historian, they would say, well, that is the, the Greek manner. And it's a little confusing to hear that because when I first heard it, I thought, well, Greek manner, it doesn't look like uh, a Greek statue or a Roman statue. But in this case, Greek actually means Byzantine. You've got that use of the gold foil background like you might've seen in a Byzantine uh, church. And there's this stiff formality of Byzantine art. So if St. Francis looks to you like he is doll-like and has a backbone that wouldn't bend even if he tried, that's what we mean by this kind of stiff formal medieval style. And this one is an altarpiece that's made with tempera on wood. And uh, most altarpieces were, were portable. They could be folded, they had wings and, and they could be moved. But you'll also find uh, later in this period that fresco becomes very, very important. Painting done directly on walls. 
but the role of a work of art like this in the time it was made was to be, uh, I'm going to call it, it's a little bit like a comic book illustration. It's meant to educate a largely illiterate population about the miracles of saints. And you want to remember that the clergy uh, spoke high Latin during the mass and that most, uh, most Italians were illiterate and spoke a vulgar version of, uh, of Latin and they spoke early Italian. So if you go over this a little bit or, or you imagine, you know, people were seeing this in a uh, church during the time it was made, it has the role of explaining the miracles of justifying the miracles of St. Francis. So here is one healing of a girl with a dislocated neck. And you notice a little bit of what I would call continuous narrative. And that means that the girl with the neck problem appears twice. Uh, she appears, you can see her coming by a door or an arch door in, in the, uh, on the left and then kneeling in front of St. Francis to be healed. And there's a very mysterious figure in this. There's like a, a child or an infant that almost appears like it's been dropped in front of St. Francis's uh, altar. And I even wonder if maybe she's carrying that in the uh, back image. It's a little hard to make out. This one is a little bit more clear. In this one, uh, St. Francis is driving out the demons. And you can see the black figure, figure demons that uh, come out of the mouth of one of the awestruck uh, people that is witnessing this uh, miracle. In sculpture, um, one of the great themes, of course, is the Renaissance, is, is the bringing back of uh, classical Greek and Roman imagery and, and you know, style and media. So when you go to the baptistry at Pisa, in other words, the baptistry building that's next to the, the famous Leaning Tower, that people say may fall down at any moment, had to, had to throw that in there. But when you visit and you see this magnificent uh, pulpit, you can see the influence of Roman art and you also can see uh, some evolution uh, when I get to it. So this is one of the uh, panels carved by Nicola Pisano in the middle of the 13th century. And this is a good point to say something about Italian names. If you wanna roughly translate Nicola Pisano, it means Nick from Pisa. Now, you know, what we call the surname was often the, the name of where someone uh, came from. But Nick from Pisa uh, carved this relief of the Annunciation, the Nativity, and the Adoration. And you notice with the three titles in the words, there are three separate things that have happened. So the Annunciation is the angel tells Mary that she will bear the Christ child. And it's a little hard to make that out because the angel's arm is broken. You can see him there in the upper left. It was a delicate arm that's been lost, but he sort of had his hand up in a gesture of you know, recognition. Mary somewhat looks towards him, but also the nativity has happened. The child has actually been born and the Christ child whose head has been broken off, that's worse than losing an arm, is at the bottom of the image there with the baptismal font with someone pouring what looks like a whiskey jug over that uh, tiny body. But then there's also the adoration of the shepherds and they are crammed into the upper right corner. So you see the problem, one of the problems that artists kept trying to solve is, uh, you know, how do I put three things into one carving? And the answer is you do it pretty awkwardly. Now we have film, so we can tell a story in film or video and, and make it all unfold over time. But it is in many senses a rather advanced work with all the deep space around the carving, the, you know, the relatively naturalistic figures. Uh, speaking of naturalism, there are some lapses, including the fact that Mary might be 12 feet tall if she stood up, you know, compared to the figures in the foreground. So the scale is distorted. But we're going to give Nick from Pisa credit for making a fairly advanced carving. And of course, what he had in mind, this is a, a Roman carving. And you can see that in their own time, the Romans were ahead of where the early Italians were in the 13th century. I mean, that's a graceful, uh, remarkably naturalistic carving. Look at the flowing drapery and uh, remarkable carving. So knowing that there were improvements to be made, Nick's son, Joe, Giovanni Pisano, remade the same image about uh, 40 years later. And it still tries to be very, very ambitious, the announcement, the birth, and the adoration. But there is maybe greater movement. There's greater dynamism in this carving. 
uh, Mary bends forward uh, to reach toward the child and to tuck in a little blanket that, that enfolds him. She's a little more active and she's been downscaled to fit better with the other figures. And in fact, the scale works better overall. And you can see that more of the figures have what you and I might call a hint of emotion. They, they glance at each other. Uh, we see Joseph scowling down there in the left corner because he's been kind of ignored from all the uh, action. We see the uh, goats crammed in toward the right. Uh, you can see that this artist, you know, the son of the first artist is trying to make a more dynamic, more emotional, more alive scene. And that gives you a hint of the progress, what's ahead in the uh, Renaissance. So this impulse, the impulse towards more naturalistic art begins to be a signpost, kind of a guide for artists. And naturalism takes many, many years to truly develop. And in painting, it means the development and the rediscovery of scientific perspective. But over a period of time, this is where they're going. Cimabue and then his very great student Giotto begin to base their art increasingly on the observation of real forms. And let me say something about that. We often call uh, medieval art denatured. In other words, it's like nature was sort of drained from the art. And if you wonder why was denatured art popular or why was it, you know, why was it tolerated? The answer has to be that uh, religious image, religious imagery needed to be symbolic. It needed to tell the story. It didn't need to look like a particular person. But in this period now in the 13th century, there's more looking at the world. There's more observation making its way into art. And we think of Giotto beginning to take what we'll call a scientific uh, approach, stressing the importance of what he saw and gaining knowledge of the real visual world to add to his art. So starting with Cimabue, I think an art historian would still say, well, I see the, the Greek manor, I see the Byzantine here. We still have the, uh, the gold foil, you know, the kind of gold of the heavens. And we also have something, if you look around that throne occupied by the Virgin, you have something that I would call playing card angels because they each have a gold halo. And if you look at them, you almost could imagine them being laid down on cards, one on top of each, each other. Uh, Chimabue doesn't really attempt to make us feel that they are gathered in a crowd that recedes in, into, the, into the background. We don't have perspective uh, to group those figures. We also have a couple little windows underneath that uh, violate the sense of scale where uh, I imagine some wise men are talking about the birth of Christ or maybe reading one of the, reading the New Testament and predicting what's gonna happen. They kind of add a sense of there being onlookers to witness this great miracle. And I should also mention that uh, maybe one of the more advanced parts of this painting is the chair that the Virgin sits in, because the chair is like a section of a Colosseum. It's almost a piece of architecture that also doubles as a throne. No, but going in quickly, you can see it's both rather lovely and graceful with gold highlights on the blue gown of the uh, Virgin. And uh, you can see the eyes looking left and looking right in the faces of the angels. You can see that Mary has no knuckles. She has tubular fingers. So I think a little more work is needed there. But again, gradually advancing towards something more, more credible. When we get to a student, Giotto, Giotto, he gets credit for a number of things. One of the things he gets credit for is giving his figures more weight, as if you could almost imagine them carved. As imagine, you, you can imagine Mary, for example, kind of bearing down on this throne, which is very delicate and which has wings that seem to fold out like an altarpiece. The picture almost feels like an altarpiece that's coming to life. I think that's what, what Giotto was, was going for. And the playing card angels are a little less stacked and a little less regular and a little less flat. You notice that some halos are cutting off the features of other angels, placing them into the background. And we also have kneeling angels in the foreground whose shaded gowns and wings tell us that perhaps even angels have weight, which that's quite a concept because it makes them more real. And uh, a detail of that picture, I think you can see what's happening in the shading that follows the jaw of the Virgin. 
I once had a student say in class, did they have airbrush back then? Well, no, they didn't have airbrush, but uh, maybe using a flat brush, like a shaving brush or stippling, uh, Jato began to achieve this very, very subtle kind of shading that wrapped around the edges of his figures and is a predecessor to what you and I might call chiaroscuro of clear and dark. And then mixed with that, look at the wonderful rosettes, the designs behind the throne, which tell us we still have something medieval going on. Almost feels like a medieval you know, scribe had added those, uh, those details. One more wonderful detail before we go to the next image. Look at the two fingers just emerging under the arm of the infant Christ to let us know that the mother's supporting him. So Giotto's uh, greatest works tended to be public fresco cycles. And he is very, very well known for this magnificent decoration of the arena chapel in Padua. And this is how you feel walking into the room and seeing the full mural cycle. But you notice I also, I chose a photo that looks toward the ceiling. And in the ceiling, there is a very, very rich and brilliant sky of ultramarine blue along with portals or what we, you would call an oculus if it was part of a building, skylights that let heavenly figures look through into this kind of miraculous building. And I wanna take a moment and say something about the blue. This will take you back to the Renaissance in a really interesting way. So during the early Renaissance, Mary would wear a blue cloak and that was you know, part of religious law. And there were actually laws passed to, bat, to ban ordinary people from wearing blue because it was the color of the virgin. But it was also very, very expensive because blue came all the way from Afghanistan in the form of lapis lazuli. And uh, Cennini, the writer and, uh, and artist, called it the most beautiful and perfect of all colors. And the supply of ultramarine blue, which now is synthetic, although maybe in New York you can still buy tubes of lapis lazuli, but, but anyways, uh, it was controlled by the church and it was more expensive than gold. So during the early Renaissance, when you walked into that chapel, you were dazzled by the ceiling and the color because it's likely you had never seen such an expensive expanse of color like that. But back to Giotto, he began to observe and depict light and shade and light begins to have a direction in his work. So in other words, rather than having Byzantine light, where the light of heaven, that kind of golden light, illuminates everything evenly, Giotto is a bit of a scientist realizing, well, if it comes from the sun, that has a direction, or if it comes from a window, that has a direction, not, not a divine source. So he used this new uh, bridge toward realism. He used light to put together drama, holy lessons, and this new element, truthful observation of the world, which is why uh, the panels that he did in Padua have a new kind of emotional impact. And here you can see that uh, in this lamentation, you know, the grief of, of Mary over her son, we see a new kind of human presence. And the body of Christ although draped around the loins is essentially a kind of a nude, like a classical statue. And if you look at what the figures surrounding the lamentation are doing, one throws his arms back in a kind of grief. Two others stand on one edge with a sort of confidence having a conversation because maybe they, they have confidence in the resurrection. So they're not as upset as the other people. Another figure clasps her hands to her face under her cloak to express grief. But there's this greater variety of uh, poses and expressions, even a figure whose back is turned to us, who reaches toward the head of uh, Christ. And that tenderness, even I admit kind of a strange tenderness, because I think Mary's face has a mask-like character, the way it's presented. But the, uh, there are knuckles in the fingers now. There are hands supporting the head of Christ. The halos are still there, but they are somehow three-dimensional, they look, they look scalloped. Uh, there is just a greater humanity and tenderness now as if we can step closer to the people and begin to believe in them. And that is the achievement of Giotto. That's why his work became such an academy for later Italian artists and all the great artists would visit this chapel to take notes from it. And still a ways to go toward naturalism, right? 
you know, looking at the angels, an almost believable head, but tiny arms and then wings as if they're glued on in the back. There's, there's a lot to be understood. It, it really wasn't until Leonardo da Vinci that we got any depictions of wings or flight that had some credibility to them. So now let's talk about Duccio. Let's talk about a Sienese artist and compare his work to, uh, to Giotto. Uh, his greatest work was the Maesta altarpiece. Maesta meaning, you know, the majesty, if you will. It's a two-sided work, which depicts the enthroned virgin on the front and then contained 26 scenes on the back. And my understanding is that it's never been fully uh, put back together because it was taken apart at some point. And we have, through the internet, we have kind of have a piecemeal, uh, you know, construction of what the back originally looked like. But this was a three-year project and it was already famous in Siena when it was completed and it was carried through the streets in a procession to be installed in the cathedral. And what you wanna look at when I show you the images, you'll see that the Virgin on the front is rather formal and rather old fashioned, rather like something that Chimabue might've painted. But when you look at the small scenes on the back, you see Duccio beginning to do what Giotto had done. So there is the uh, tremendous, you know, 13 foot wide, if you will, center panel, tempera and gold leaf on wood. And you can see that uh, kind of old fashioned manner there, uh, playing card, saints and angels, but bolder color, uh, the use of blue on the cloak of the Virgin. I have to say that the Christ child himself is beginning to wake up a little bit. And I always get the question, why is it that the infant Christ tends to look like a little man like a tiny grown-up shrunken down. And the answer is that in, in teachings, he was presented that way as born almost with you know, the wisdom of a, an older or more mature man. So you see lots of images of the infant Christ looking like he's ready to, to make a speech or give a sermon or, or make a statement. But that is the front of the Maesta altarpiece. And that is a reconstruction of what the back would have put like, looked like if all the panels were, were put back together. And looking at just one of them, look at the detail and the sensitivity and the advancement that you see in the betrayal of Christ. Because there is Judas leaning in really uncomfortably and Christ looking back with some suspicion and around them, this crowd scene and uh, helmets jostling in the background. So Ducha was thinking about how do I create depth in a, ground, in a crowd scene? And how do I give a feeling of agitation? And then maybe a little bit more comically on the right, you can see the evangelists are saying, we're out of here. <laughs> you know, they're, they're frightened and they lean in a diagonal and they make their way away. And yes, in back of the torches and spears are what I can only call lollipop trees because the observation of nature is still not you know, complete in this image. But the figures are beginning to be boldly colored, dynamic, more emotional their gowns are becoming more flowing. So more advancement in the work of Duccio. I love to show this image because I think it's one of the very, very few Duccios you can see in the United States. They're mainly in, in Italy. And this one was purchased by the Met Museum in New York about, uh, I think 12 years ago. And they didn't disclose the price, but it was reportedly $50 million. And it's for this tiny work of art that's the size of a, a sheet of notebook paper. And uh, it has uh, burn marks in the frame because for many, many years, it was a devotional painting where people were placing candles next to it and uh, you know, lighting flames. So they left the uh, damage in that original frame. And it has a tiny Christ who reaches towards his mother. Uh, and, and I can only say, I think he has a lima bean head. There's a, a strange character there. Maybe you can see it you know, up close, another Duccio that's in Italy. And you can see he makes eye contact with a mother who looks towards us as if to say, look what I've got here. But the tenderness is there. The drapery is there. There's a sensitivity. I mean, I, th I think that's something real that an infant would do would be to grab part of his mother's clothing. I think of infants always grabbing, you know, earrings and, and you know, reaching for things. So this one is a little more of an infant than a grown man. In different cities, in different parts of Italy, you get different stylistic developments. And in Siena, 
you get this style, which is uh, different from what I've seen in other places. It brings together the gold background of the Byzantine style, but it fuses it with the greater naturalism that's developing in the work of Duccio and others. And it's yet another annunciation, you know, the announcement to Mary that she will be, uh, she'll be bearing the Christ child. And uh, you can see that the angel holds an olive branch and in a gold vase that rests on the floor, there are Easter lilies. And in terms of iconography or symbolism, the vase represents the purity of Mary's womb, right? The Immaculate Conception and the Easter lilies tell us about the resurrection of Christ. So there's a lot of iconography present. And there's also the Holy Spirit. If you look toward the very, very top of that filigreed arch, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove is racing down to impregnate Mary. And I'd have to say from her scowl, from her expression, that she may not exactly want to be pregnant. <laughs> a little bit of, you know, reticence or emotion there in this picture. Um, interesting detail about uh, art and frames in this period. This one has a very, very elaborate architectural frame. And I've been told that frame makers were often paid much more than painters in this era because their work was considered more, more elaborate and more extensive. And this one looks like the, the cross section of a church complete with lattice work and arches. And there's a wonderful detail that I'd like to point out. If you look at the tall columns that divide the sections, those kind of pillars, they have some detail at the top that you call flamboyant. And flamboyant, of course, means flaming, as if those uh, columns are bearing tiny flames. And the backstory to that is very, very interesting. Before uh, stonemasons and architects learned to make uh, stone roofs with you know, complete vaults and flying buttresses and all of that for cathedrals and churches, it was a pretty regular occurrence that the wooden roofs would burn and the towers of the church might also burn. And so the idea of flames coming off the towers of a church was so common you know, that it became incorporated in what you'd call the flamboyant style. The Lorenzettis were some of the most famous artists uh, working in, in Siena and the Lorenzetti brothers took Duccio's ideas further and developed more spatial illusions. And their work is known for what I'm gonna call carefully observed domestic details. So not just the details of, let's say, clothing or expression or emotion, but maybe the details of the world surrounding uh, Siena. So you can look at a, uh, a Lorenzetti painting like this one of the birth of the Virgin and feel like you are in Siena in the 14th century. Take a look at this three panel altarpiece and I'm gonna start you at the far left at the upper arch and you can see the cathedral out the window. So you really have been taken into a very, very luxurious kind of apartment. And the Virgin is there uh, having just given, uh, well, excuse me, the Virgin's mother is there. Sorry about that. Having just given birth to the Virgin who's being baptized down on the uh, bottom. So uh, it, uh, first of all, it takes us into the architecture by making us believe in the recessional space of the architecture. You can see the perspective there on the left where there is a, a vanishing point that takes us down through the arched window across to the cathedral. You can see the floor lifting up and the tiles in the floor imply that there's a vanishing point behind the uh, Virgin's mother. You know, and it's a world of, again, greater uh, perspective, greater architecture, greater believability. There is that woven cloth she lies on and the uh, gold pillow with the tassels which probably give us the real details of a Siennese home in this pyramid period. But we also want to remember that the Renaissance is about bringing back the ancient. And so if her pose looks very like the pose we would have seen a woman uh, taking on an Etruscan sarcophagus, which is what you see I, I brought in there, it really does come from that early Italian tradition as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, hybridity in this image. I want to go sideways for a moment and say something about the Italian economy, because it, it's interesting to talk about the economic development that happened in this period. Um, if you didn't know this, the word bank comes from the Italian word banco. And that goes back to the fact 
that uh, during the medieval period, many or most of the money lenders were Jewish, and they often lent money after the services outside the church at a bench or a banco. And it's a really amazing topic because you can see some of the roots of anti-Semitism in the things that happened during the medieval period because uh, wealthy kings and nobles would borrow from the money lenders to finance their projects or their wars. And then if they couldn't pay, they often instituted uh, uh, an atrocity. They would have a pogrom, you know, rather than paying back the, uh, the Jews. But what began to happen in Italy is that the attorneys for the Bardi family or the Medici family began to gradually question and rewrite the rules of usury or money lending. And that's why there was an explosion of uh, banking in Italy, the 11th and 12th and 13th century. So the great early bankers of Europe were Italians. And then by the late 1200, uh, 1200s, the Italian bankers had become the agents of the Pope and the Pope had a great concentration of wealth. Along with this banking economy, the patronage system where wealthy bankers, wealthy cloth merchants began to pay for uh, religious commissions that really took off and became very competitive. And the rivalries between the city states, for example, the rivalry between Fianna, Siena and Florence motivated the patrons to put more money into art, art and architecture. And then one more footnote in the 13th century, two of the great Florentine banking uh, families financed a great deal of wool export and gave large sums of money to England and France. And those debts were defaulted on in the middle of the 14th century. So anyways, interesting to think about the rise of banking. Florence was of course a key, maybe the key uh, city state in the rise of the Renaissance and the Florentines you know, rapidly began to pride themselves on being economically and culturally superior to the other city-states. The flourishing of humanism, especially sponsored by the Medici later, uh, began to flourish and take off in, in Florence. And over a long period of time, the Florentines built what they felt was the greatest cathedral in Italy, a cathedral that could hold 30,000 people. And what I'm going to do for a moment, I'm going to take a short talking break, and I'm going to let a video take over for five minutes. And I'll tell you more about the video uh, when it's over. But this is a conversation from a uh, channel called Smart History, where you're going to hear a dialogue about the construction of Brunelleschi's dome, and also see some video that I think will help you understand the architecture. We're in Florence and we're standing outside of the Duomo. The Cathedral of Florence. And we're looking up at Brunelleschi's dome. It's huge. Until St. Peter's, it was the highest dome that had ever been raised. And in its width, it was as wide as the Pantheon. Almost. If you think about the Duomo itself, it had been planned in the 14th century. The plan was to build a dome that had a span nearly equal to that of the Pantheon. And of course, the Pantheon had been built in the ancient world, and that technology had largely been lost. Right. So first and foremost, what Brunelleschi did was an amazing engineering achievement. The challenge was how to build a dome this wide without wooden centering. Generally, when you build an archway, and the, and the dome is really just an arch in, in, the round. in the round, you put up a wooden framework. So this is the wood to actually support the dome until it can be locked in place by the keystone. Exactly. So you don't even really need mortar to hold it together because you've got the keystone. The problem is, is this was so big, they couldn't actually get enough lumber and lumber that was strong enough to hold the thing up until they could lock it in place. And so there was no way to do a wooden scaffolding or centering to hold it up as it was being built. So how do you build this dome that inclines inward and not have it fall down? There's two problems. You've got that issue and then you've got the problem of it wanting to splay outward. A dome exerts pressure not only down but down and out. 
And so one of the biggest challenges is how to raise the dome and deal with that downward and outward pressure, not cracking the walls underneath. Now, in the Asian world, for the Pantheon, for example, they had dealt with that by just creating sheer bulk. In other words, the walls got to be 10 feet thick. I think actually in the Pantheon, there's something like 20 feet thick of concrete. Right? But Brunelleschi couldn't do that here. So what he's done instead is, first of all, he made the decision to make the, the dome as light as possible. And that means that it's basically hollow. It's a double shell. And within the shell is a staircase that snakes around that allows one actually to get to the top. And if you look, you can see people just below yeah. the lantern up at the top of the dome taking in the view of the city. He also created ribs. You're doing a lot of the weight bearing. And then in between each of the major ribs, which are visible on the outside, there are two within that we can't see. And those are actually locked in place by a series of horizontals as well. So there's this whole skeletal structure that's actually holding this piece together. I think most importantly, he was able to develop a system where as the dome was being raised up, as each course of stone and brick was added, it was actually locking itself in place. And so it was self-sustaining. Another way that Brunelleschi dealt with the downward and outward thrust was to create chains inside the dome made out of stone and wood locked together with iron, like a girdle to hold the dome in and to counter that downward and outward thrust. You might think of an old-fashioned wooden barrel that has a couple of iron rings around it to help keep the wood together. Brunelleschi created cantilevered scaffolding that could rise as the building went up. And so the workmen had a place to work. Brunelleschi also built new kinds of pulleys and hoists to bring up these heavy, massive pieces of stone to the top of the dome. So he created this ox hoist. They're just these remarkable machines that no one had ever seen before. He actually even designed a special barge to go down the Arno to be able to bring the materials to the city itself. Yes. If you think about the sheer quantity of material that had to be imported and had to be hoisted up and had to be put in place, right. it is just this remarkable right. project. Bricks, bricks that had to be created, stone that had to be quarried and brought here, platforms for the workmen to work on, machines to hoist everything. And I think it was Alberti who said something like, what Brunelleschi did, we did without, without, precedent. Pre without having any example to lean on. Uh utter invention. Exactly. Now, we think that Brunelleschi may have gone to Rome and may have studied ancient architecture as well as sculpture there, but there is no precedent in the ancient world even for what Brunelleschi accomplished here. Now, it's important to say that the dome is not hemispherical, like the dome on the Pantheon. It's actually kind of tall. Right. It's kind of pointed. In a way, it has more of a Gothic shape than a classical shape, but in that way, it matches the Gothic church itself. If you look closely, you can see these exedre or blind tribunes that Brunelleschi added around the outside of the dome. They actually look very classical compared to the Gothic church. They in fact look like Roman triumphal arches. So there's this curious classical moment here in an otherwise very Gothic church. And it's a church that is not only Gothic but really referring back to the Tuscan Romanesque tradition, especially in terms of the polychromy, the colored marbles, which Brunelleschi also carries up into the barrel just below yeah. the dome itself. But ultimately, you've got Brunelleschi, who through his engineering genius is solving a problem the Western tradition had never been capable of solving before. How does one span this enormous space? And in order to do it, he's surpassing the ancients that he's even here paying reverence to. Well, that's a lot of information, but uh, you know, I know Martha spent a lot of time in Europe. I bet she and, and many of you have walked that staircase between the two shells of the uh, dome. But one thing that watching that video should, should put in your mind is just how ambitious and how driven uh, the people of 14th century, 13th, 14th, 15th century Italy were to you know, take on projects that uh, borrowed from classical art and architecture, but took it even further. There's an interior of the uh, building. And, and one thing that's interesting to point out, and this will make sense later in the course too, you want to remember that uh, Italian churches often had very little or even no stained glass so that uh, the decorations might be the architecture itself, which I think is really the case here, or you know, card reliefs or uh, sometimes frescoes, but they are more austere in the interior uh, 
and they are more about the structure than they are about, uh, about decoration. There's another one in Florence, Santa Maria Novella, with the uh, kind of zebra striped uh, ribs that came from Islamic architecture. So I have to I have to wind this presentation down a little bit. Let me give you a few more images and uh, kind of an ending to uh, give us pause and and to think about what might be coming next. So there was a great deal of architecture begun in this period. So the the west facade, the face of uh, Orvieto Cathedral, was begun in 1310, but it wasn't until what 1499 that Signorelli came along and made these uh, incredible uh, murals of the damned in hell that inspired Michelangelo not much uh, later. So you wanna think of these uh, projects that began in the, the 13th century as just the beginnings of uh, things that will really flower and blossom in the, uh, the high Renaissance. You also wanna think of Venice a little bit separately. Uh, the Venice had a doge and the doge did not uh, report to the uh, the Pope. The doges tended to be very wealthy, independent men who were told to bring their own furniture when they moved into the uh, doges palace. Very separate, Venice had a separate sense of itself. In Siena, look at this magnificent Palazzo Publico where thousands of people could uh, gather when the bell rang and could hear a talk from their officials. And along with all of this great building and public energy and patronage and wealth. Uh, you've got art that uh, I'm going to call some of the first great propaganda art, these incredible murals by the Lorenzetti brothers. This one, Peaceful City, is from a suite of murals that are still there in the Palazzo Publico in Siena. They're about the effects of good government, something I know we're all really craving right now. And you can see the idealized graceful figures and the merchants who make their way through and into the city. And you can get a pretty good view of what Siena might have looked like. And uh, Florence and Siena both had many of these observation towers. Uh, there's still a few left where you could maybe see, you know, enemy coming toward these great walled cities. You can also see this mural, the peaceful country where the wall is a break in the wall. And you see the good government and the salubrious effects of that kind of leaking into the countryside where there are rolling hills, fertile, fertile farms, you know, everything is being grown that, you know, is needed in the city. And you've got the kind of Monty Python detail of a beautiful floating angel with a scroll that tells us a story of what's happening, even if we don't want to be told the story. And there's a new kind of perspective there the rolling hills and a hint of what you'd call atmospheric perspective as the hills get a little bit more blue in the background. But all of this briefly came to a screeching halt with the Black Death. And in uh, 1347, 1348, uh, we think that the Black Death probably came on, you know, along with rats uh, from ships from uh, Genoa, but it began to spread across, you know, Italy and other parts of Europe. And there has been one estimate that uh, as many of half or even more Italians perished in a period of a couple of years. And I, I find this hard to believe, but uh, one stat I saw said there's an account that says there were only eight people left in Siena at the end of the plague. But uh, oddly enough, or maybe, maybe, not, maybe not surprisingly, uh, Italy recovered very, very well and very, very quickly after the Black Death. And as someone once explained to me, you know, we talk about real estate prices here in California. If half the population was gone, you could really get a great deal on a condo. You know, it's a glib way to say it, but there actually was, uh, you know, a real economic boom after the Black Death. So just to let you know, before we, we take a few questions, I'll let you know what's next. We're going to move to Northern Europe when I see you on uh, February the 5th. I also want to uh, credit Smart History, which provided the video that I showed you. And smarthistory.org is a wonderful resource for more of these art historian narrated dialogues about works of architecture, works of art. A lot of pleasure in watching those. And of course, there's a great deal more material about the Renaissance. Want to let you know that every month, a month after Martha uh, creates the webinars, 
I'll post them on my YouTube channel. And if you missed Monday Morning Modernism, it's there on my uh, YouTube.